Our week four recap is brought to you by the fact that it's just time to experience New Mexico. I've been to New Mexico, great food. You've got your red versus green chilies. I'm a green guy, whatever that changes between us is okay. There are sweeping vistas. It's a great road trip state. I cannot recommend New Mexico enough. Enjoy starry night skies, delicious cuisine, and unique architecture you won't find anywhere else. Learn more and plan your next trip to New Mexico at newmexico.org slash solid. New Mexico, true. Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Hey everyone, welcome to our week four recap. The week is done. We've got a ton to talk about. Ty is still attending to family stuff as he 100% should be, but I obviously hope to have him back soon. But in his stead, please help me welcome CBS's Chip Patterson. He's here to help me talk through yesterday and I guess Friday, and he is coming to you and me from some kind of, are you, are you in a palatial suite in Tuscaloosa, Chip? I am. Shout. I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily mess up <laughs> your sponsorships, but no, I will you're say good. that... Uh, that the the, uh, the what the gold elite status here at this uh, this this hotel in Birmingham actually mm-hmm. oh okay it, you know it, it it got me the fridge it got me the Whoa. microwave and so you know when I got back in from Tuscaloosa at like ten o'clock I was getting ready to settle in and, and watch the the Ducks and the Cardinal and I was able to get a little lean cuisine from the marketplace and sit down and, and feed myself it was it's it's now i'm here with you so yeah that, we make it happen and it's good to be back with you obviously before we go on before i must jump in here quickly because i forgot to do it last week at the top of the episode or last episode uh solid verbal at gmail.com if you want to send us a, a quick note or you can tweet us at solid verbal facebook stuff solid verbal you probably are smart enough if you're listening to a podcast you probably know your way around a computer but so just google solid verbal and follow us from there Um, And before we go on to the recaps, let's start this show the way we start every Sunday show, which is your wonderful, spicy, passionate voicemails on a segment we like to call The Reverbs. Old Dominion? What? What? Hey, this is Dylan from Colorado. Hey there, boys. Jim from Chicago. Hey, this is David in Arkansas. Hey, Dan. Hey, Ty. It's Joshua from Little Elm, Texas. We just got done watching uh, the Stanford-Oregon overtime game, and I don't really have anything funny to say. It's just, wow. Oh, my God. I just watched my Stanford Cardinals come back against Oregon. I am so happy. You know, Dan, it's uh, tough sitting here after that loss. Um... It might be weird, but I'm a little encouraged. I think uh, Mario Cristobal and, and company can coach a little bit. Interesting day of college football. Stanford, Oregon finish was insane. I'm sorry, Dan. You guys had it at the end. Just couldn't punch it in. So Stanford's kicker is named Jet Toner. Was PC load letter taken? He's not my Sega. He's not your Sega. He's our Sega Whiteside. Did you know that JT Daniels and Alvin Ross and Brown went to high school together? Or did you know that JT Daniels should be getting ready for prom now? Or did you know that JT Daniels should be a senior in high school? I am just now gotten home from USC versus Wazoo. Friday night games in Los Angeles should be illegal. And I am writing my congressman. Oregon State's turnover chainsaw, still awesome. We all might have to eat our words over Herm Edwards because I think he actually had a good game plan. We just beat Virginia Tech. I believe in these guys. I'm so proud of them. You better have four dude alerts for, you know, Blake LaRusse with 500 yards passing, Jonathan Duhart, and Travis Fulgham, and Jeremy Cox. Yes, sir. So let them look ahead. By the transitive property of football, Old Dominion just beat Florida State by like five touchdowns. Wahoo lost! The Hoos won, and the Hokies lost to a terrible ODU team. What a weekend! Today I learned that Old Dominion has a football team. Is the story of this Wake Forest game Ian Book? Are the Fighting Irish turning the page on Brandon Wimbush? It turns out at Notre Dame, the backup was better than the starter. Hello, Kentucky. Welcome to the top 25. After all the ups and downs Tennessee has suffered, it's kind of reassuring they can still find a boring way to lose to Florida. And 
And we went to Rocky Top. Don't know the rest of the words. Is Purdue the best three-loss team in the country? Just got done watching little Scottish Frost take on 1997's one true champion. Guess who just got murdered? Someone better tell Jim Harbaugh that it's not really nice to throw bombs when you're up 40 points. I think it's time we have to start considering that Dwayne Haskins might be the best QB Ohio State's ever seen. Dan, Ty, are you ready to say it with me? Texas is back. Texas is secretly decent, folks. Pistols not firing the water for the Cowboys. It is a national travesty that no one in America can watch Army versus Oklahoma. I demand that Congress do something about this. All right, there it was. I I love it. I love the enthusiasm. And listen, college football is nothing if not for emotion. So let's start because I feel like if I'm going to jump into a cold body of water, I'm not going to put my toe in. I'm not going to gently walk down the steps. I'm just jumping in and ripping off that proverbial va- Band-Aid. So we're going to start with Stanford, Oregon. Yeah. It is it is my show today, and I'm going to get through this and make peace with it in, in ways that uh, that I deem necessary. So what was your reaction from afar as somebody with no stakes emotionally in this game with, uh, with what you saw? I, I had small stakes okay um <laughs> and uh i'll leave it at that mm-hmm. and maybe that has uh created some bias but man that that didn't feel right no. yeah it didn't yeah i didn't i didn't love one bit of it because the my phrase all week was if you believed in oregon going into the season if you believed that uh, year two under Jim Levitt with players like Jalen Jelks, Troy Dye, and like Thomas Graham is one of my favorite defensive backs in the entire country. Okay. Loved him as a prospect. Was been very excited to watch him get burned early and continue to come along. And if you believe that Justin Herbert and like Justin Herbert played so well for mm-hmm. in this game, I just the bet was Oregon through three weeks had not done a lot to make you believe that it was going to fulfill that potential. And this felt like a spot where if they were going to turn it on and fulfill that potential, it could happen here and it should happen here. And it felt like they did almost everything uh, to close that one out and the miscues, the mismanagement. And I have Stanford has a number seven beside its name. I do not think Stanford's the seventh best team in the country. Right. And uh, because of all those things, I don't come away from the game being like, boy, Stanford, this is, this is really championship caliber stuff. I come away with a lot of disappointment knowing that uh, this Oregon team had it right there and thinking about what that could have meant. Uh, you know, you look ahead down the schedule that Washington comes to Austin, right? Correct. I think so. Yeah, yeah I mean, Oregon so goes I, to Cal next week and then Washington uh, after that. I believe after an Oregon bye as well. Yeah, I just, you know, I was really excited about this Ducks team coming into the season, and I, I kind of, I, I don't want to sell all of my stock, but mm-hmm. I, I will say that I'm losing confidence uh, in that bet, in that call, in that claim uh, that this was going to be a team that was not only going to, you know, have a chance to beat teams like Stanford, but because of the way the schedule set up, really dictate the way that the Pac-12 championship race goes. Yeah, I think all of that is correct and fair, but I will counter saying what happened wasn't necessarily Stanford dominating Oregon in multiple phases. I don't no. think there's reason to sell off Oregon stock if you were a believer in them because I thought what they did on both sides of the ball, and I, I think it starts with what they are able to do on offense, they really accomplished what Mario Cristobal has, has had in his mind as what Oregon's offense should look like. They they smashed Stanford up front and, and were able to establish the run. Justin Herbert spread the ball around. We, we didn't see sort of mid-tier, shorter routes early on in the season, but it was, he was going to all parts of the field. He was making plays. He had a ton of time to throw against the Stanford defense. That's been pretty good. They hounded JT Daniels in USC uh, a couple weeks ago. So there was something very 
promising and you could see the potential of this Oregon offense they go up 24 7 at halftime they drive up and down the field they're balanced Justin Herbert I finish his regulation I believe 25 of 27 so he's crazy accurate Dylan Mitchell was a, a huge play receiver and he goes for over 200 yards on the game and defensively they were getting after KJ Costello Bryce Love was really held down for a good chunk of this game they were faster than Stanford everything was uh Everything was set up nicely for, if not a comfortable Oregon win, an impressively uh, thorough Oregon win. And so there were mistakes. It was the right call with the pylon because it's a dead ball if the ball is behind the goal line as Oregon's running back hits the pylon with his foot. It's brought back to the one. And then Oregon makes a couple mistakes that ends with Stanford running the ball, a fumble return back for 90 some odd yards and a touchdown. So it was a 14 point swing in about nine seconds. And then the the second half play calling slowed down a little bit for Oregon and they they sort of did gather themselves and I think it was the right call if you didn't see this game uh Oregon basically had a second and two they get to that first down the game is over with uh, about a minute left and there was a fumble and Stanford turns it into a field goal to tie it and they win in overtime so unforced errors for sure and correctable mistakes for sure you just a couple better snaps and holding on to a ball this is I don't think there's a lot of reason to sell Oregon stock. I think there's a lot of promise here. There's a lot of talent. When you have that combination of a good defense and a good quarterback, I I tend to agree that Stanford is probably not a top 10 team, but getting wins when you shouldn't win is something that top 10 teams do, and and Stanford earned it ultimately. So I, I am still optimistic. And, you know, even if they go nine and three, 10 and two, I think they're on the right path. So if, it like it, it this should not necessarily be a marker for um you, you know what a team is because right. a betting line is set on uh, a marketplace mm-hmm. but i think oregon is one of like 11 teams that has not covered a spread yet this season is sure. that concerning uh i don't think so i mean they they looked a little bit sloppy early on everybody said that they didn't show much of the playbook and that's fine whatever i just vegas doesn't have a great read and this was 99% was like the the probability at the end of this game. Somebody screenshotted the ESPN thing that Oregon wins this game 31-28. So, I was so bad. I wanted Oregon to win this game so badly. Same. I apologize that I was It's just, okay. I mean, I, like, like I almost borderlined on irrational fan. I was so mad at the end of the game because I uh, I write um yeah, I don't know. That's that's not even like I I had fully locked myself into the headspace that this was going to be an Oregon win that was really mm-hmm. going to jumpstart everything Same. for the Ducks <laughs> and to just hit reverse on that. Yeah. And I, I, I have a lot of respect for David Shaw. I have been a Stan for David Shaw mm-hmm. uh, often, but that, that little smirk on his face at the oh, end of the game, I was me. like, Oh, I know it's going to haunt me. Especially yeah. like he has the opportunity to essentially ice things for Stanford and he just calls that jumbo package that doesn't work out. Like it was a perfect way to take advantage of David Shaw's stubbornness and yet Stanford still pulls it off. So good for Stanford, good for David Shaw, but I'm going to choose because the alternate is not great. I'm going to choose to use that as a positive that uh, that Oregon can be and looks to be a top 15 team in the country. So I'm I, it's it's the only thing I have. It really is. Um, <laughs> let's go to Texas A and M Alabama before we spend far too much time on the Pac-12 North. You were at this game. It looked for a little bit like Texas A and M was going to make this a bit of a game via Kellen Mond's legs and their own defensive line, but there was obviously the inevitability of Alabama on both sides of the ball that ultimately swallowed up Texas A and M. I'm not fully i'm not down on texas a&m at all i think they they were you can only be impressive if you are 99 percent of teams in america against alabama for so long especially one that has firepower all of a sudden on offense with tua tonga vailoa so i came away impressed with texas a&m in small little chunks or d'oeuvres but the entrees belong to alabama yeah i i think texas a&m is one recruiting class away Mm -hmm. from causing problems and two recruiting classes away from maybe being a fully realized sec west contender basically for me the game hinged at the very end of the second quarter when alabama just popped off 10 points real quick yep because texas a&m was hanging in that game and then going into halftime it was done and what was so fascinating about that first half 
was that, like you mentioned, Texas A&M did a good job of bottling up Alabama's run game early. Mm -hmm. What is terrifying is that Alabama, particularly when they were in the late clock situation, almost went, you know, spread, up-tempo, no huddle. Okay, you're going to stop our run game. Well, we're going to do the classic extension of the run game with the flare screens, the Mm -hmm. shovel passes, and, you know, that's... That's like spread team stuff. That's stuff that we're not used to seeing from Alabama. The book on Alabama is you stop the run, you take away the play action pass, and then all of a sudden you can you can get them off balance. But the contrary is true where they almost look with all of that talent at wide receiver and running back and Damian Harris and Najee Harris both being really good receivers out of the backfield. You know, that counterpunch that Alabama has with Tua at quarterback is is terrifying. And so right. the that's the the first thing that k- stood out to me was like Texas A&M did a good job of taking away out al- taking away the Alabama game plan. The fact that Alabama has that counterpunch is ridiculous. And then I I continue to be impressed with Kellen Mond. I did not think in 2017 Kellen yeah. Mond would look like he has looked so far. And I mean I, for for all of the Christian Ponder EJ Manuel jokes that you want to let fly, Jimbo Fisher has uh, shown that he can he can take a quarterback and he can you know provide improvement uh, especially at the college level. So I I'm I'm looking at Texas A&M and I I'm coming away uh, encouraged. Uh, I will also throw this out. I believe that we need to remember Miami's turnover chain was not patient zero because Alabama had the ball out belt mm-hmm. in 2015 and. Patrick Sertain and this Alabama defense, young players, Xavier McKinney, <sighs> Dylan Moses, uh, you know, they have brought back some of that uh, like Eddie Jackson kind of edge to this yep. Alabama defense. And the fact that those young studs and freaks are out there hungry to uh, strip balls, get interceptions, create mm-hmm. turnovers, stand on the sideline with that ball out belt. I was uh, I was standing like right there. We had to do uh, half a halftime shoot on the field, and so I'm sitting there, and you know the coaches are just holding up the ball out belt, screaming and jumping up and down before every single snap when Alabama's defense is on the field. Like, come on, you want to come get this right now? And I was like, man, this this Alabama defense, if possible, might be overlooked and a little underrated because mm-hmm. the offense is so nasty. Yeah, that that's terrifying too. The amount of youth on that that defense that's already learning, that's already adapting to good SEC offenses. We <laughs> yes. saw it against Ole Miss last week. Not that Ole Miss as a complete unit is anything that terrifying, but what what Texas A&M was able to do and will continue to do as they improve on offense and it not affect Alabama's defense. And eventually it's just the defense swallows up a quarterback and offensive line, you know, there are coverage sacks and even when Texas A&M is, you know, providing good coverage against whoever, Jerry Judy and Henry Ruggs and Devontae Smith, Tua is calm enough to say in his brain and make it execute to his left arm and shoulder, oh, Irv Smith for 17. Okay, I can handle that. I can do that. That is, it was, it, it was almost reminiscent of, and it wasn't even a check down thing of what Nick O'Leary meant to Florida State in 2013. Where it's like, oh, you're going to take away all of these potentially NFL receivers. I'm going to very calmly hit my H-back tight end up the sideline for 9 to 12 yards and happily move forward. It's just, it's I'm, it's ridiculous. I'm so glad you mentioned that team uh, because, and you know, you like you said, there was what, Rashad Green, Kelvin Benjamin, Devonta mm-hmm. Freeman, James Wilder in the backfield. And they were just going through hanging about 50 on everyone. And and that's that's the feel that I get from this uh this Alabama team that we might be because I think that Florida State team uh was challenging the Sam Bradford Oklahoma offenses Mm -hmm. in terms of production and points per game and I I think that we are dealing with that kind of potency and that kind of excellence right now and as as much as as not fun as it might be for most of the college football world I am I don't I don't hate the Golden State Warriors. I don't think they broke Same. basketball. I, I I'm just I want to appreciate excellence. And so far, uh, what I've seen from Alabama has been excellent. You you always do see like a, a color commentator, an analyst, whatever 
they'll take like that all 22 view after a play and they'll circle like a slot receiver like oh he ran free the quarterback totally missed him and it's very frustrating if that's your team there is something about Tua who just who doesn't miss that tight end running free who doesn't miss that slot receiver who doesn't miss that like dig route where a guy was open and he just missed it in his progressions and Tua is not the most physically talented he doesn't have the best arm of all time but that like circled miss guy is a circle completed guy with Tua running this offense, which is, again, I've said it before, it, it's terrifying. It is that Sam Bradford, Marcus Mariota, uh, Jameis Winston, that level, Baker Mayfield, potentially. He has that ceiling now. We're only through like four games. But in terms of his decision making and confidence and steeliness and poise, we, we are getting to that you know Heisman caliber ceiling. It's gift. I mean, it's it is absolute. The the ability mm-hmm. to see receivers open is a gift. You can't it, it you cannot train it. Hey, how about this? Tua's calves mm-hmm. are huge. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I just I was like I, I was in this, man. Those things are just just tree trunks. Yeah, and I no, they're I was, grapefruits remember, in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's uh, yeah. He's he's awesome. I'm, let's, I'm a big Tua fan. Let's stay on the topic of dominant offense because it's time to talk about the old Dominion Monarchs. Oh, it is, buddy. It is time to talk about Virginia's one true college football program. I don't know how far old Dominion can fly, but they start the season 0-3, including a demonstrative loss to Liberty. They lose to Charlotte, which is not a thing many teams have done these past couple of years. Oh. And um, they go out and just stomp Bud Foster's Virginia Tech defense. Like, I feel like even though Kirk Herbstreit was in Eugene, there was a very weird part of his body that felt something was wrong in in the force. In the universe? Yes. (laughs) Um, Virginia Tech got stomped on defense, and nobody saw this coming because Old Dominion hasn't been good. And this game goes back and forth, and late in this game, Old Dominion goes up seven on an incredible catch and throw, and... Virginia Tech isn't able to make things happen with their backup quarterback, Ryan Willis, who was pretty good. He was This This was not Virginia Tech taking a big step down uh, when Josh Jackson leaves the game. But on, I don't know, first or second down as ODU is just trying to run out the clock, they run whatever it was, 40-plus yards, 30-plus yards for a touchdown to go up 14. And Virginia Tech, I remember we, we got some tweets after the Florida State game, like, can this hokey team win 10? All of a sudden, and you looked at their schedule, and you're like, "Yeah, I mean, they'll probably lose something dumb, but not Old Dominion dumb." And now here we stand with ODU comfortably winning against Virginia Tech. Yeah, I think that all of this backfired horribly. The fast start, mm-hmm. you know, those the uh, Virginia Tech uh, comes into the season big time. Uh, chip on the shoulder type mentality. We're being overlooked. Um, they, this this trip, by the way, over to the you know the Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach area. Mm-hmm. This is this is supposed to be a big recruiting trip. Virginia Tech yes. probably had a lot of recruits at this game, and I do think that uh, the loss of Josh Jackson is worth mentioning yeah. and pointing to because. The quarterback room wasn't and isn't great or particularly encouraging behind him. But still, to your point, like no fully healthy Virginia Tech defense coached by Bud Foster uh, should be expected to give up nearly like half a thousand yards of total offense to Old Dominion. And so for for Bobby Wilder and the Monarchs and and that program, which, you know, what only in the last like four years was a full FBS member mm-hmm. uh, after making the jump from the colonial FBS independent all the way to to be able to get that kind of in-state win. I mean, the the people around that Virginia Beach area were saying, like, this this might be best win for this school, any program, any sport mm-hmm. of all time. Just absolutely a uh, huge victory for them. So you that's where, like, you almost venture into college basketball territory, right? I guess sure. it felt like a, a two fifteen upset yep. in a little bit, and uh, or or maybe even uh, shout out to Virginia UMBC, Ooh. but like the <laughs> good local this, reference though. This one's gonna sting for Virginia Tech, but I do think that it might be a punch in the nose that this Hokies team needed, and you know I'm 
I'm not going to put any any blame or credit uh, on the the week off that they had because of the canceled game with ECU. But mm-hmm. you know, you were still kind of riding high. And yeah. Justin Fuente had some comments after the game, just feeling like um, his his team had lost an edge. And boy, you know, this Virginia Tech team recapturing its edge, uh, recapturing the way it played against Florida State, particularly on defense. That yeah, Virginia Tech could still win the ACC Coastal Division, show up in the ACC Championship game, and for a Virginia Tech fan who was looking at this season coming into the year, I would say that that was absolutely accomplishing or exceeding expectations and goals, but man, there's no Virginia Tech fan, no matter how many games this Hokies team wins, that's going to be able to like get through the office without the one ODU fan just rubbing it in their faces. Yeah, it, I didn't expect to be extolling the virtues of Blake LaRussa on this show. <laughs> but happy to do so. Happy to do so. And Virginia Tech, they'll be all right. And long term, I think they'll be all right. But I'm glad you brought up the 15 seed, two seed NCAA tournament comparison because that is the exact thought I had watching Oklahoma Army. That Team A comes in to play way more talented Team B, but comes in with a very specific game plan that will either succeed or just go terribly south. And I'm not going to pretend like a lot of you saw this Oklahoma Army game in its entirety because I believe it was a pay-per-view game, which, madness. Didn't didn't know that those types of things still existed, but I found a stream of this as things got tight online in a far so from legal manner. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thousands of college football fans watching Twitch to yes. see if Army will pull off the upset of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh. Oh, this antiquated sport is just barreling into the future, and I love it. Uh, yeah, watching somebody's living room watch this game. Always <laughs> always wonderful. But Army comes out and keeps the ball for, like, I think the official time was, like, 44 minutes out of the 60 of game time. But it felt like they kept the ball for two hours and 45 minutes straight in this game. Oklahoma makes a couple of mistakes. They score early on to go up pretty comfortably, and then Army just... Eight-minute drive, nine-minute drive, ten-minute drive. They claw back into this game, ultimately, when Oklahoma forces them to make plays through the air. Even after a a missed Oklahoma field goal to win this game that goes to overtime, the Sooners pull it out. But, boy, Army put themselves in a position through just two, three, four, five. There was something like 13 or 14 of 19 on third downs at one point when Oklahoma had faced three three third downs and so it's it's very difficult to say well it's a it's a moral win when you were that close and had those opportunities but does this say anything to you about how we perceive Oklahoma when there probably won't be a big 12 team that can replicate this strategy especially now that Kansas State might be trash (laughs) <laughs> Kansas State's not Kansas State anymore. Kansas State is taking a year. They're taking that. Yeah. You know, they're taking a what was what's it called when between Sabbatical? high school and college? Oh, they're, oh, a gap year. They're taking a gap, a gap year. year. Let's just this is Kansas State and Bill Snyder, who is far from a gap year. Let's 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 call it that. Um, I I'm not coming away with a lot in many um, panic signs. I, I still have Oklahoma in my you know my handful of teams that I think is among the best in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, I. I think that this was encouraging for Army. I saw Army in the you know the the season opener against Duke, and that was not a great performance uh, for that team. And to see that, and, and like I came out of that opener on that Friday night thinking, oh man, they they miss a Mod Bradshaw. Mod mm-hmm. Bradshaw meant so much to that program, and he was just the key to everything. And so the fact that Army has uh, sort of found its footing again this season. And that's really what I saw from this Oklahoma game is like, okay, um, what Jeff Munkin has been able to do within that program is not just uh, be a, a one season or a one star player type team, but instead one that we are going to be counting on uh, to be in the mix. And, and one that, you know, they what, it, what matters to the Army football program, they needed to close the gap on Navy. And this, and I think that within the, uh, the military academy and the commander in chief trophy race that this is more evidence to that idea that army has started to close that gap on navy uh i wanted to pitch this one at you hey man. we were discussing in our workroom are you impressed by kenneth murray's 28 tackles or 
do you just look at it as a wild statistic that is indicative of the way the game was played? I'm impressed. I mean, it's there's a certain amount of resilience and uh, just stamina to be able to stay in the game that long and make those plays and not have Army rip off an 81-yard run. That there is there is that amount of focus. And I get that he was on the field for however many crazy number of plays. And so maybe as a percentage of plays on the field, it's not as impressive. But that's so many tackles. It's so many. That's, that's so many get, times where you are tasked yeah. with bringing a fast bowling ball down to the ground efficiently. And I, I'm not generally a huge total numbers person as much as I am as a percentage of whatever. But that's... Sure. That's so impressive when, and I know the rules are hurting army a little bit with, you can't really cut block unless you are facing them. You can't do it from the side. It's made it harder for option teams, but even with all of that, Murray is that's, that's a ridiculous number. That is a stupid number. So I'm going to say, yes, I am impressed just because of the stamina and, and will that he, that he put on display. Yeah, we we have to we do a name we name a player of the week uh, mm-hmm. whatever like just all the different accolades and that was the debate was is is Kenneth Murray's twenty eight tackles an impressive uh, statistic uh, worth celebrating and, I, and Dan I'm with you I was, you you got out there and you were close because I do think that only about six of them were solo right that was the counter argument okay. but I was like I don't know man you were you were out there. You were making the right reads, and you put your body on or near the ball to bring it to the ground. I, I credit you for that. I think you should be celebrated for yes. your new Oklahoma school single-season record. How much of life is just showing up and putting yourself out there? In love, uh, in professional terms, everything. Yes, yes. Just, just show up. Show up, try your best. Uh, let's stick with that theme, because you know who is out there? That's a professional segue. The Iowa tight ends. You know who else wasn't out there? Much of the rest of Iowa's offense. Um, That's not actually fully fair. They ran the ball relatively well, but in a losing effort to Wisconsin, who eventually, I mean, the game was much closer than that final score indicates because of a a couple last-second scores by the Badgers. Wisconsin wins this one, 28-17, on the road in a very difficult Kinnick Stadium. Alex Hornibrook has a nice game. Jonathan Taylor is pretty good. Wisconsin's offense went long stretches without moving the ball downfield, and that's mostly because of Iowa's defense. And Iowa's offense, which has struggled most of this young, young year, got going a little bit through the air. TJ Hawkinson and Noah Fant were the the big play guys, but also moving the ball on the ground a little bit. And ultimately, Wisconsin bounces back nicely from the BYU loss. They get a little bit more focus defensively. They start, you know, they filled some gaps that they weren't against BYU. And the West appears to be, especially with what Michigan, Nebraska, what Minnesota did against or didn't do against Maryland, Wisconsin. And I don't think there was a huge doubt, but obviously last week was a setback, but in the driver's seat with a, I would say a pretty impressive win on the road against Iowa. Yeah, I and you know maybe I would have thought that, like if Wisconsin had not lost last week to BYU, my my view of this game probably would have been a lot more different. But man, they needed a get right spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, bad, terrible, terrible beat on the total here. Uh, if you like me were riding the under, mm-hmm. that late touchdown was Rough. awful. <laughs> yeah, I mean Wisconsin Iowa under is a principal play before the number was even posted. Yes. I was like, uh, uh-uh, no, let's go under we anything. Go unders. Mm-hmm. Let's let's do it. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned that for the for an offense that I for an offense that coming into the season I thought could be uh, among one of the best and more efficient in the entire country. I have been a little bit disappointed, yeah. but um, you know they they kind of caught their rhythm when they needed to here. And you mentioned the Big Ten West race, the head-to-head advantage against what I look at as absolutely uh, the most uh, likely contender to that title. It it looks like Wisconsin, <laughs> you know, sunrise sunset. Wisconsin's yep. going to be back in the Big Ten championship game. The big picture is that I don't think even as I think BYU. And uh, I know we've got BYU Washington coming up in a little bit. Even as BYU continues to have an opportunity to make a statement and show just the incredible improvement, I do think that Wisconsin, both in the way that it's played and the fact that it took an early loss, has really hurt its own uh, college football playoff 
chances. Mm -hmm. But as, as again, we go back to the conversation that opened the show, you know, when you're looking at the inner workings of the, these races and, uh, you know, what, um, what Paul Christ and, and Jim Leonard are, are trying to, to put together at Wisconsin in terms of building a perennial contender that's ready to take the next step, being able to go in. I mean, like Iowa beats teams at night in Kinnick Stadium and Wisconsin did not get beat. And I give a big, hearty two thumbs up to the Badgers for being able to close that out and a big, angry, uh, just snarling face also at the Badgers for ruining this under. Yes. I, at the same time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but yes, Wisconsin's defense came out really strong and prepared in the first quarter, and they finished strong, highlighted by that that sort of last second, not last second, but late interception on the on the tipped ball TJ Edwards got. So uh, impressive from Wisconsin. And you know what? Maybe they'll lose one in the Big Ten. Maybe they'll lose a couple in the Big Ten, but tough to see with the West looking like it is right now, that division going many other ways. But you know what? Iowa really, they were good on third downs. Um, Nate Stanley was good through the air. They didn't shoot themselves in the foot penalty-wise, so they were disciplined. It's just, and the fact that they had three turnovers to Wisconsin's, I don't think Wisconsin turned the ball over, including that that punt, the muffed situation where the foot hits the ball and Wisconsin recovers. Um, the fact that they were in this game late with that turnover differential is uh, it, it's credit to how disciplined Iowa played, but just not quite enough. Um, yeah, I think Iowa's a good football team. I, yeah, I, for sure. I came, out, I, I came out of that Iowa-Iowa State game. I loved that game. That mm -hmm. was like a hard-hitting kind of football game. It was everything I wanted from... It was, it was, I think, the reverse of last year. It was last year the bonkers 48-45 game. So we yes. had to bring some like cosmic balance with 10-3 to 3, uh, in 2018. And that's, I came out of that game, you know, very uh, impressed and confident with an Iowa team that, you know, I, I got to admit, I don't always have the best grip on the Hawkeyes. And maybe that's because they are existing in that, uh, you know, what, seven, eight, you know, nine win kind of area. My dentist is an Iowa grad. We talk about it, talk about Iowa football every time I get my teeth cleaned. <laughs> and uh, he's he's just a very he's got a very calm, even keeled, not really expecting championships, but Love that. you know, once wants to win the home games and and beat one of the Big Ten powers once every year. And that's you know, like they got the Ohio State win last year, and he was he was happy with the team. And that's that seems to be at least through my limited. Mm -hmm. North Carolina based viewpoint, just sort of where Iowa football is at. And that's, that's just fine. That's great. You've got a dentist with some perspective and I appreciate that. Um, well, I, I would hope so. All right. Before we go on, I want to mention something. Obviously you have incredible taste in what to consume as you look back at Saturday. There's a million games. We try to get through as many as we possibly can and, and figure out, takeaways and what they mean it's you know, obviously great to have chip on but usually it's me and ty and we spend a lot of time going through everything but a lot happens and we are a non-visual medium but there is good news the athletic is a visual medium and this is i can speak for myself and ty every sunday morning we are one of our first things if not our first things we read max olson and his saturday takeaways because it's not there's something nice about seeing everything written in front of you. You listen to the show for the the sterling personalities, but Max does a great job in not just summarizing the day, but finding those little moments that linger on the fact that Oklahoma Army was a pay-per-view game and everybody was watching this game on Twitch or some sort of illegal stream. So he's handing out awards. There's bloopers. There's just those tiny little moments and he's got a you know, backup of the week. He's got a jinx of the week yesterday. There was the the Wendy's social media account just destroying Nebraska fans. Just I it was it was ugly. And that's not something we can fully convey. So I cannot recommend enough. Max Olson doing his Saturday takeaways. It just it hits every single beat of the day. And he does it's up early. So if you are waking up much in the way with stuff that I do, video stuff, if you're waking up, you're rolling out of bed, you want to make sure you got everything from the the previous day, you read Max Olson's Saturday takeaways. You you see the clips of the big moments and the social media weirdness. Yesterday, Michigan's Chase Winovich pretended to 
eat a heart of a Nebraska. I think it was of Adrian Martinez. And it's just all there, whether it's turnover props, whatever it is, just check out Max Olson's Saturday takeaways and really indulge yourself, enrich your Sunday morning experience. Theathletic.com slash solid verbal, by the way, for 40% off, $2.99 a month. That's nothing. That's less than a coffee if you live in a major city. It's like a quarter of what subscription services cost. It's nothing. You can pause the show right now and just go to uh, theathletic.com slash solid verbal and just get on with every sort of piece of enjoyment that you can possibly consume. Open up that world. Open up the future to yourself. Once again, theathletic.com slash solid verbal and Max Olson's Saturday takeaways. We have a lot of games to get through. So okay. let's start with, let's go through the Big 12 relatively quickly. Kansas State is a mess on both sides of the ball right now to certain extents. Offensively, it was it was not great. Even with picking Will Greer off a couple of times, uh, Kansas State just gives the ball back way too quickly. West Virginia ultimately looks very but very good. They get that big play early from, uh, from Will Greer to Marcus Sims, and it's... West Virginia, I think the big takeaway from this game is West Virginia's defense, which was, I'll only speak for myself, a concern of mine before the season, given what they lost and and the talent level. It was a concern. The fact that against an offense that hasn't been performing, they kept that foot pressed on Kansas State. I've I've come more and more, come away more and more impressed from, uh, from watching West Virginia. Yeah, I, Tony Gibson's one of those defensive coordinators that all of us end up just throwing his name out there. Like mm-hmm. it's going to mean that the, the whole team's going to play well. It's like, well, you know, Tony Gibson's out there. He's he's going to have them ready to go. But mm-hmm. right now, it looks like it looks like this West Virginia defense, particularly up front, they're salty. They're attacking and yes. And you know, how how about Bigelow cashing in on all that hype? You yeah, know, like I was finally. I'm I am happy for him Definitely. as a human being for finding another home and really being able to. Uh, explode and be dominant in a way that it really felt like USC fans were out on him mm-hmm. uh, big time when he was with the Trojans. And so I, I like those stories. You know, I, I'm all for players being able to transfer and play where they want to play. And I, a lot of times it's for that opportunity that, I mean, sometimes it's just a bad fit. And yep. if a, a change of scenery can really do a lot for a player. So I'm with you. I, West Virginia, uh, one of the biggest surprises of the season is – that defense and that defensive front and i think that the way the schedule breaks out we are looking at a west virginia team that will enter november uh very much in the big 12 title race of course with their backloaded schedule uh, that's where we you know if you are not a believer in west virginia you're saying okay cool we'll see what happens uh when they face uh you know that terrifying conclusion but you know i i think it would not surprise me right now as we you know i'm sure we're about to talk about texas tcu i who who do you have who do you have more confidence in, Dan? West Virginia, Texas, or TCU? Right now? Right now. Oh man, it's gonna pain me to say maybe Texas. I know. I can't do that. I'm gonna say West Virginia. Okay. It, I think it, I think the the quarterback position I Will Greer, like we haven't gotten to see a lot of him all the time, but I if he can stay healthy, then you know, because I the quarterback room behind him is not not Will Greer. It's it, Will Greer, yes. and it is not winning the Big 12. Those are the two options right now. And uh, and if Will Greer stays in there and that defense stays salty, I have more confidence in West Virginia challenging Oklahoma than I do Texas or TCU right now. Yeah, I think the Big 12 is the clear best TV show right now in college football. And that's <laughs> just – it's just because even if we're going to keep Oklahoma atop the Big 12 in terms of tiers and probably alone right now even with – yesterday's game that second tier is the majority of the conference probably because you have west virginia texas tech oklahoma state tcu texas i I couldn't really after what texas tech did running the ball and with defense i know it's like i'm speaking a different language against oklahoma state um and and we'll go right now first to, to texas tcu texas putting together two for them Let's keep it within the context of Texas. Impressive offensive performances against talented teams in a row. And, you know, you have an emerging star at safety in Caden Stearns, who picks off Sean Robinson twice. And even though the running game isn't there for Texas, Sam Ellinger is good for two ridiculous throws a game. And yesterday he paired those throws with timely third down conversions, a couple of decent runs. I'm not 
crazy about Texas offense over the course of the season with the number of big games and, and offenses they're going to have to keep up with. But they can score 27 against these teams, and they have a defense that can <laughs> hold – like they have a defense that should be able to hold most teams to under that. Right. So, Texas right now, even with that disastrous start beating USC and TCU, they should win eight games. Right? Hey, Maryland's three and one. That's true. <laughs> but Maryland is three and one. I, I love the way that you put that. Hey, listen, no, Texas's offense. Yeah, they can score twenty-seven. Sure. <laughs> and if that's good enough, then they can win a lot of ball. I'm I'm still not a believer in Texas's offense. That's fine. Uh, yeah. And some of that is an overcorrection. I took a real bold take uh, coming into the year. And I said, I think Sam Ellinger has a chance to be the Big 12 Offensive Player of the wow. Year. Wow. Okay. It was I bold. don't think he's not won it yet. I think he's <laughs> not there, but I don't think we can write him fully off. Confident. I, I think that there are a, I think there is a list that might hit a dozen of players yeah, that have true. a better chance than him right now. But I, you know, as I get frustrated with some of the Texas play calling, the mm-hmm. offense makes me angry sometimes. I'm, I still continue uh, to look at Colin Johnson and Lil Jordan Humphrey and wonder why in the world this Texas team doesn't have uh, an incredible passing game. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm, I think that that was a great win for Texas. And now I'm starting to look at Tom Herman and the, uh, the sort of trajectory we talked. Um, we had Stanford Steve on the 24 seven sports college football podcast Mm -hmm. after Texas USC. And he said, you know, after being around the program that week and, uh, being around that team for that game, he, he was like, look, this year isn't going to be the year, but there is enough, uh, of a good energy that is proliferating through that program that the arrow is pointing in the right direction. And so as I take a step back, back and as i realized that there really do need to be uh steps to be able to have texas uh get to a point where we are confidently looking at the longhorns as a team that can get back to where oklahoma's at or challenge to be in that first tier snapping a four-game losing streak to tcu is absolutely one of those building blocks it's like the old i think uh, was it lose big, lose small, win small, win big. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know where in the process the Longhorns are, but beating TCU is a big part of that. Like, you know, I, I didn't, I don't know where, I don't know where I'm at with Tom Herman. I saw, I was a little bit disappointed when he was just, you know, mocking Drew Locke in a bowl game and we were celebrating, uh, you know, their, their six and six season. Yeah. As the a Texas big, bowl. Yeah. big step forward. Yeah. I just, you know, this was this continues to be uh, how about this a great opportunity for the Longhorns to make strides to where they want to go and I don't think they're going to reach that this year but this was a very impressive win for them yes Every, and everybody should be scared because Tom Herman has this reputation as this like really great offensive mind because of what he accomplished at Ohio State the offenses at Houston weren't great and nope. I mean Greg Ward was basically always on like one and a half limbs. But I I think everybody should be scared if Tom Herman, if and when Tom Herman replaces Tim Beck at offensive coordinator. And similar to the way like when Gary Patterson hired Meacham and Cumby, where they are a really good offensive coordinator hire away from 10 and 2, 11 and 1. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't I, I hope that happens for the sake of entertaining college football. I'm not positive it does. Texas is weird. Texas is so I'm not, weird. Yeah, I'm not. I'm. I'm not ready to. Uh, I'm. Not, I'm not ready to let. Like, if you had told in in a vacuum in another season, it's like, uh, all right, just these two weeks, Texas mm-hmm. has back to back wins against USC and TCU. I'd be like, all right, fry me up a, a Snickers. Let's go to Red <laughs> River right now. I am right. ready to see this. And I don't. I'm not feeling that way here on Sunday, September 23rd. I still think Oklahoma is seven to 10 points better. And that's even factoring in rivalry. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's fine. Uh, quickly Baylor beats Kansas. So Kansas still two and two and has a chance to win four or five, maybe if everything breaks correctly, but it's not as likely as it looked last week. And Baylor looks strong with Charlie Brewer being extremely efficient. And that's, I mean, there's not much more to talk about with that. Iowa state 
doesn't look wonderful, but fine in a win over Akron at home. And quickly, Texas Tech, behind what sounds like British comedy legend Alan Bowman, um, (laughs) makes surprisingly just lays waste to Oklahoma State through defense and turnovers and a really good, sound defensive game plan under David Gibbs. They run the ball with a, a running back who I think was going to leave the program. Seth Collins, I forgot, is you know catching balls for uh, for te- Texas Tech, excuse me. And all of a sudden, Tech is in that, I think demonstrably so after this win, going to Boone Pickens and beating Oklahoma State by 24. They're in that second tier where there, there are still issues, but can they beat TCU? Can they beat West Virginia? Sure. Absolutely they can. Yeah. With this offense, yeah. he throws for 600 last week and 400 this week, Alan Bowman does. And Texas Tech is looking, at the very least, a team everybody has to take very seriously in that conference. I loved Alan Bowman in Life of Brian. Yeah. He was really fantastic. <laughs> um, hey, our friend Tom Fernelli had uh, another – his his bold t- Big 12 take coming into the year was he thinks that Texas Tech is going to show vast improvements on defense. I – had not really seen that come to fruition. I felt like we definitely saw it on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And when you add the red Raiders to that crowded middle of the big 12, it takes a league that uh, is always seeming to fight for its reputation. And it, it gives them another, another squad that you can hold up and say, if I dropped Texas tech in the ACC, if I dropped Texas tech in the big 10, if I dropped Texas tech in the pac 12, if I dropped Texas tech in the sec East, you know, I'd, I think that they would be able to hang, and and that is a good sign for mm-hmm. the health and the strength of the league as a whole. Yes. Um, let's go to the Big Ten. Friday night, Penn State needs four full quarters to run away from Illinois, but eventually does. Miles Sanders runs for 200 yards, and James Franklin should just start telling his team before the game that the second half is about to start because that's what the issue right now. Penn State has started slowly this season. They pour it on, and... They go to or they play against Ohio State next week. I believe that's in Happy Valley. Um, it is. So there's that. Uh, I don't know how much time we should actually talk about Penn State, Illinois, Ohio State lays waste to Tulane. The only big takeaway is Dwayne Haskins is very, very good. He is a very good quarterback. And did you see the story after that? There have been preliminary discussions. I believe this is according to the Athletic. There have been preliminary discussions about Ryan Day as head coach in waiting. I have. And it immediately had me checking Wikipedia mm-hmm. to see what age Bob Stoops was, if wow. that makes sense. Because the, when Bob Stoops retired, it was floated as a theory that we might see more of that, mm-hmm. where coaches say, look, you know, made you know, oogle, oodles of money mm-hmm. and, you know, this is this is really stressful. I'm in a good place in my career. I'm happy with what I've accomplished. Uh, I'm going to, you know, take on other challenges. Now for Bob Stoops, I happen to believe that those other challenges are shaving a couple strokes off his handicap yep. at the country club. And I don't know what that would be for Urban Meyer. He certainly seems like one of those people that can't quit football. But I think he's 55 years old. Bob Stoops is 58. Mm-hmm. Um, I if if these preliminary discussions are in place, then you know maybe we really are in the next three to four years going to witness uh, the a changeover at Ohio State. And you know will that go smoothly or will it go sideways? Right. A lot of times, coaching waiting does go sideways. Mm-hmm. It worked out for Florida State, but it was not pretty as Bobby Bowden continued to hold on. And certainly Urban Meyer looks like I I get the, I read Urban Meyer in his defiance. um, And I read Urban Meyer in his attitudes uh, and his confidence in himself as someone who might hold on a little bit too long. So I'm curious to see how that might play out, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe Urban Meyer follows in this Bob Stoops trend of stepping away from coaching a little bit earlier than we're, we're normally used to seeing. Yeah, Nick Saban aside, because you always have to say Nick Saban aside in these conversations, 2018, 2019, 2020 college football success on a major level skews, feels like it's skewing younger and more, not necessarily energetic, because Urban Meyer appears to have a lot of energy, um, but 
you know, whether it's James Franklin and Dabo Swinney or Tom Herman, it's just, it's 365, it's 24-7. Hey, listen to the 24-7 College Football Sports Podcast on CBS Yay. slash 24-7. There is, you know, whether it's, you know, you have to be constantly DMing recruits on Instagram or Twitter and staying on top of, you know, the, the social media edits for players and texting and FaceTiming. And it's just, it feels more than ever that there is a a life cycle to coaching successful teams on a new year's six playoff type level and urban myers had the health issues i think bob stoops father passed away relatively young which was one of the reasons for him leaving early i could see that paired with how these last few weeks have gone for ohio state and urban meyer in terms of the public eye it it, I said it at the time, it sort of feels like the beginning of the end, and maybe that's the case as Ohio State sees itself as maybe being in potentially very good hands with Ryan Day should he take over the program. I agree. And, you know, what an opportunity for Ryan Day. Mm-hmm. Chip Kelly, Chip Kelly's old quarterback, you mm-hmm. know, the golden child, who's gotten all these, you know, he's he, he got tapped. His, his career trajectory, it sets up for an opportunity like this. And uh, one Dwayne Haskins note, Yes. They run that fly sweep a lot. Mm hmm. You know, it makes me think that that passing touchdown number, it's, uh, yeah, the toss sweep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 (laughs) It's like, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's a, that's a touchdown pass. I mean, it's a shovel pass (laughs) to a brilliantly talented track star who's able to outrun the other 11 defenders to the corner. But yeah. But Dwayne Haskins is awesome. And, uh, the, this is not an original take necessarily i think i share this with a lot and it might have been mentioned here Dwayne haskins continues to show that uh, as urban meyer's loyalty has been something that has bitten him i wonder if you go back and look at last season and wonder if his loyalty to jt barrett cost ohio state a chance to be in the college football playoff that is my exact feeling that is, there is just the watching jt barrett and even last year going against michigan when Dwayne haskins came in when barrett gets dinged up um it was like, oh my God, the potential the, of just watching a quarterback who's comfortable and in rhythm and you don't need to run all the time. And maybe that was Urban Meyer looking at JT Barrett and saying, this is what his strength is, so we're going to take advantage. But the ceiling is higher with what Dwayne Haskins can someday accomplish based on what he's already shown. And that's pretty exciting as a football fan. It's, 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 difficult, it's difficult to root for a team that has it all. But I, I'm I'm pretty happy to watch Dwayne Haskins and his accuracy and poise. What's your early read on Ohio State Penn State? I think I like Ohio State. I, I don't like Penn State's defense. I don't like their you know seeming lack of focus at times, and they, they've just looked a little sloppy. I know it's in Penn State. It's in Happy Valley, but uh, yeah, there's there's something about Ohio State right now that they're rounding into shape, even without Nick Bosa. They're just they're too deep everywhere, and I think they I think Penn State is just a tick behind where they've been these past couple of years. I would agree with that. I've been calling Penn State. Uh, isn't Bruce Banner the Hulk? Yes, right. I guess not David Banner. David Banner's the <laughs> rapper and producer. Correct. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've I've been calling them Bruce Banner because it seems like they need to get like punched in the face or scared mm-hmm. or you know like awoken. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, 35 point fourth quarter. Okay. Right. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. I lean Ohio State here. Yeah, there's there the pilot light is needed for Penn State. Right. They're not burning yes. on their own. Um And that's not that's not a sign of a great football team. It can be a sign of a very good and very talented yes. football team, but not a championship caliber football team. Yes. There was something about this Penn State team these past couple of years that I think was led by their defense, even with the the rightful attention being paid to certain offensive players that they are just they're probably too young and too green on defense at this point to feel fully confident in them really threatening for a, a maybe a new year six but pro, like the playoff is seems not necessarily in the cards but that's okay because they're still fun to watch with with miles sanders and, and ricky slade and trace mcsorley um quickly because there really isn't that much to talk about michigan just smothered nebraska and this wasn't... That's what they do. That's what they do at the big house. That's they, what they, they do run at the, it big up house. At the big house. Yeah. It wasn't. It. it wasn't particularly entertaining to watch because Nebraska is a wounded cat and has nowhere near the talent needed on both sides of the ball to compete with. I don't think Michigan's a great team, but a very, very strong and good Michigan team. And 
everything was fine offensively, you know, beyond Karan Higdon, who was really, really good. And the offensive line seemed pretty good. But Michigan made plays everywhere. Nebraska comes in with Scott Frost saying, everybody, be patient. And then he also starts his wounded quarterback. Okay. That's that's all I really needed to know about where Nebraska's head was at going into the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. It feels like Karan Higdon, every time I flip over to these Michigan games in the big house, he's always got a 30-yard touchdown run. Mm-hmm. Like he's his breakaway speed is great. That is a credit to Karan Higdon. And yes. The fact that uh, you know they they run, uh, you know, they've got like what fifteen offensive coordinators: Pep Hamilton, Jim McElwain, uh, <laughs> Jim Harbaugh. Yep. Like your uncle, somebody else. But <laughs> somehow they all get on the same page and they they scheme up they like scheme up something that allows Karan Higdon to to break loose. And when he does, his breakaway speed is great. He's a fun running back to watch. But that is what Michigan does in the big house. I am not going to be looking at Michigan as a Big Ten title contender and until they go on the road and uh, continue that level of performance. Let's stay in the state, even though the game was outside of the state. Michigan State, I, I won't go as far as ugly because beating a, a decent Indiana team on the road is totally fine. They need a pick six and I believe a fake field goal to get to 35. The offense still inconsistent, but Winning games on the road in the Big Ten against a decent opponent is nothing to look down upon. Michigan State, after a week off and a loss to ASU, with a, a pretty decent 14-point win, Indiana comes back a little bit late. Uh, Rutgers gets murdered by Buffalo. Your Buffalo Bulls, I believe. I wanted Bulls. to say Bulls. Yeah, you yeah, got it. Buffalo Bulls. Yeah. Um, Anthony Johnson is a very good receiver, and Buffalo might be the favorite in the MAC, which is great. Yeah, Lance Leopold, you know, if you were buying into this D3 national championship winning coach to be able to get it done, he's it's taken him, uh, I think he's been there maybe two years, three years. He's He's got it. Buffalo, my buddy Barton Simmons was all over that early. He was like, mm-hmm. Buffalo is going to be a very good team. They could be an eight or nine win team and threaten in the MAC. And so, yeah. And uh, and Michigan State, their inability to run the ball, very disappointing. Weird. However. However, yeah, they have no more uh, Allen brothers or Conklins left. And I, I guess they, <laughs> they need to go back to the Allen Conklin machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like their wide receiver, Cody White. He's a sophomore, yes. uh, four-sport athlete from inside Michigan. And I, I think that he's a really special dude. And Michigan State's offense is basically relying on some uh, those wide receivers making plays with Brian Lewerke. It's very, 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 very weird, but it is a, at least something – as opposed to having to rely only on a defense, which to this point, in my eyes, has not lived up to that Spartan standard we're used to. Not fully. And Maryland, patience, goes back to Kasim Hill, who has a nice day, and they just run through Minnesota. They finish that one 42-13. So as you mentioned earlier, Maryland is 3-1 and one, and a totally okay, decent team, whatever. Let's go to the SEC because there was actual excitement and unexpected results in the SEC. We already talked about Bama, Texas a and Georgia looks sloppy in the first half. I don't believe the offense gets into the end zone. They score on a blocked punt and I believe a scooped fumble uh, and take advantage of Missouri mistakes in the second half to ultimately win this game. And it got sort of interesting third, mm-hmm. fourth quarter. Uh, Georgia wins this one by a couple touchdowns. Yeah, I mean, the this is where if you are believing in Georgia, the fact that they didn't play all that particularly well, particularly on offense, and still managed to find ways to get it done on the road. Georgia has already played two of its three toughest road games of the SEC schedule and won them both, and that that's a good sign for the Bulldogs. They went to South Carolina. They went to Missouri. They still have to go to LSU, but in terms of winning that division and getting back to the SEC championship game, uh, even when they don't have their A game, even when they don't really have their B game mm-hmm. offensively, getting getting those Ws, uh, that's a good sign. And if again, if, if you want to drink up the Georgia Kool-Aid, you're saying, uh, I, t- I tell you what, they, they hit adversity at Missouri and they overcame it, overcoming adversity. That's what Kirby <laughs> talks about all the time. <laughs> Fair way to describe it, or fair way to not describe it. Uh, A very misleading score, but ultimately, again, it's a win. Auburn wins 34-3 over Arkansas. The Tiger offensive line, not particularly strong last night, and they need two touchdowns from kick returns to get to 34. So they get in the end zone twice on offense against Arkansas. 
Defense was fantastic. Hard to gauge too much, though, from playing against this Arkansas offense with Ty Story. But an ugly offensive night for Auburn against Arkansas. Two straight and maybe even three straight if you want to take it back to Washington. Mm -hmm. I've I've yet to be really impressed with Auburn's offense. Yeah, same. I I think they're a little pedestrian at a lot of levels. Wide receiver likes... Wide receivers are okay. They're fine. I really like Whitlow, uh, mm-hmm. their freshman running back. But, I mean, he's only a freshman and still trying to run behind an offensive line that, as you mentioned, you know, they, they repl- had to replace a lot of starters, and it's it showed. So Jarrett Stidham is an elite talent who doesn't seem to have enough pieces around him for Auburn's offense to scare anyone right now in the SEC. Not a misleading score. Kentucky 28, Mississippi State 7. Ooh. Talked to Andy Staples going into this game, and he was extremely high on Kentucky. Not necessarily in this matchup, but extremely high on Kentucky being competitive in this game, if not winning this game. And they leave no doubt. Benny Snell in defense is, you know, that's like the wedding crashers thing. That's what Kentucky is. And that's a great thing to be because Benny Snell leads the way, keeps the, the offense on the field, keeps the Mississippi State defense gassed. And I believe it was Josh Allen who was all over the place for Kentucky against this Mississippi State offense, which, for better or worse, is going to be pretty one-dimensional because of Nick Fitzgerald's limitations as a passer. Yeah, sometimes when you're playing cards with a bunch of friends, whoever is the dealer gets to set the rules. Mm-hmm. If, if you let Kentucky set the rules of the game, they're going to beat you. Yes. So that's like the my number one thing with Kentucky is do not play their game. Do, do You have to be able – to get some offense early, you need to be able to make Kentucky press because their defense is very, very strong, very, very good. You mentioned Benny Snell. Like if if you get lulled in to the game that Kentucky wants to play, Kentucky's gonna throw down that like wild card that you didn't know was wild because they read the rules too fast right when they started. Mm-hmm. Like, like, yeah, we got aces, deuces, jack says, and then the one-eyed <laughs> queen. You're like, what? I, we, I didn't even know. But so yeah, I I look at Kentucky as a team not that will uh nest like. I don't look at Kentucky as, all right, watch out, you know, but credit to Mark Stoops, credit to that program. It was an unbelievable environment. They're mm-hmm. 4-0. They're about to be ranked for the first time since 2007. Shout out to Andre Woodson. And, uh, and yeah, just if you play their game, then you risk losing. And not that they needed much help, but hey, thanks, Mississippi State. 16 penalties for 139 yards. There needs to be a Yikes. thank you note in the mail already for that so whoops can't can't do that against a team as you mentioned that is particularly fine with dictating the style of play south carolina consistently pretty good against vandy i will admit i did not see this game so i'm looking forward to watching this so maybe i'm totally wrong i don't know if you saw any of this game but it appears to be a a solid win over a vandy team that's at least okay yeah i'm I might look at that as a letdown. I haven't done get to watch it either. I might look yeah. at that as a letdown spot for Vandy after the close loss to Notre Dame. We'll see. Ta- game, the tape will tell the tale. A game I will not be watching because I know why it happened like it did. Tennessee's not very good. Florida is, they're fine probably. They're not particularly good by their standards, but six turnovers is going to lead to a comfortable win. And that's what happened. Uh, the fact that, I don't know what assistant it was, but the fact that, the Tennessee assistant who's writing on the whiteboard, Jeremy Pruitt kicks the whiteboard and then he continues to write after the whiteboard has been kicked. That yeah. is perseverance. That is, is perseverance that Tennessee needs to take notes from. And uh, Wes Rucker from 24 seven sports who has been a pal to me over the years in terms of getting insights on Tennessee. He wrote a column and he, it was like, you got to It was a message to Tennessee fans. If this is going to get better, it it's going to be really bad. I mean, the Tennessee had a player leave in the middle of the game. Yes. I mean, Vontae Davis style. Didn't want to go on the uh, field, and so Pruitt kicked him out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's there is uh, this is going to be a long climb back to where they want to be. Yes. Um, we mentioned ODU and Virginia Tech as we move to the ACC quickly. Miami, the big story there is Nikosi Perry comes in, I think, on the third drive of the game and looks very good for the duration of this game. We'll talk about Miami at another time on this show when they ahead of a, a bigger opponent than FIU. Um, we didn't mention Purdue looking very good against a BC team that came in with a lot of momentum, and they very much did. Good win for Purdue. I believe this is their first win of the season, and you know what? That's fine. David Blau looks very good. Rondale Moore, another ridiculous game after you should look up this catch and run and tackle breaking fun if you haven't seen it yet. North Carolina, their first win against Pitt. I did not see this game. 
I don't think we can spend any time talking about it. I will watch some extended highlights later on. Virginia, very much real. Just and Louisville, very much woof. Um, don't know how much of this game you watched, but they. I mean, Virginia has a quarterback. Virginia has some skill talent. Um, it's really fun to say, and you can tell me if I get this right or wrong. Olamide Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. I think. Uh, I don't think the emphasis is on la. Okay. Olamide. Olamide. Think, okay. Yeah. He doesn't have a huge have game, re- but Virginia. Very quietly, three and one as they sort of enter their the rest of their ACC slate. Zacchaeus is one of the best yards after catch guys in the yes. ACC. He's very, very, very talented. And Louisville, it, their fall to literally like they might be one of the worst teams uh, in the ACC. North Carolina, don't take too much away from that for whatever reason. Fedora has Narduzzi's number. Beat him every single year. Yeah, fair. Uh, Florida State You're- beats an FBS team. Which listen, small victories, small victories. <laughs> Florida State, it's 37-19. They brought back 19. to do something? They, yeah. they were allowed to tweet do something after oh, this one? Thank goodness they were finally. But yeah, Florida State, it's probably still going to be a long year, mostly because of that just mash unit of an offensive line. But beat a team that you definitely should beat, and that's a thing, because now they're on a one-week streak of doing so. Uh, Syracuse lays waste to UConn. NC State against, I, I think, a feistier Marshall team than people realize. They win that by double digits. And Duke looks like a divisional favorite at this point, especially because they're performing without their starting quarterback. They do it in a, a pretty complete way, if not kind of surprising way, because a lot of it comes on the ground as they beat. I mean, it's North Carolina Central. I don't know how much there is to take away from that. Um, and then finally, as we go to the, I guess we have the Pac-12 left, USC edges out Washington State on Friday night by three. Port Augustine comes back after targeting the previous game, and then immediately, he's not called for targeting, but boy, does, does he love putting a, a hat on a hat, a helmet on a helmet. <laughs> um, a really nice day for, a really nice night, excuse me, for JT Daniels. He's getting more receivers involved. The, the offense as a whole looks good. The pass defense had looked pretty good. And Gardner Minshew, I believe the second, um, tore up USC a little bit and put them in position to win before, I believe, USC blocks a Cougar field goal that would have tied it late. So a nice bounce back after losing a couple straight, uh, USC able to to get up on Washington State. And in a revenge spot, we talked about Stanford, Oregon. I don't know if you stayed up late for Washington ASU, but oh yeah, baby! This this Washington team is going to be it's going to be hell for Washington fans over the course of this year, yeah. because they have that you know top level top four potential because of the defense and good Jake Browning, and bad Jake Browning and some defensive miscues gives you teams that shouldn't be in games against Washington making it games late. Washington's my favorite under team in the country right now. Yeah, and it's like the defense. And Jake Browning make it a great team to bet the under for <laughs> because Jake Browning's limitations as a quarterback uh, absolutely come into play. And the defense, like you mentioned, is, is playoff caliber. But mm-hmm. I have I've been floating this theory around. And uh, with your intimate knowledge of the Pac-12, mm-hmm. I would like to throw it at you. Sure. Is it worth considering Jonathan Smith's impact on Washington and what they might have lost when he goes to take the head coaching job at Oregon State. I think so, yeah, because part of this, part of the struggles of Washington's offense have been situational, have been play calling, have been figuring out how to best position Jake Browning. We saw Chris Peterson sort of apologize for this last week after their uneven win uh, against, they had Utah last week, I believe, that they need to figure out better ways to put Jake Browning into advantageous situations. And I think that it has to stem from, especially with what Jonathan Smith has done early on for Oregon State, which hasn't been much on the scoreboard and tangible results, but they're competitive, this Oregon State team, which they haven't and they weren't these past couple years. And I think that's definitely something worth considering that Washington, even with Jonathan Smith last year, they lost something dumb against ASU and the Stanford win was, or the Stanford loss was definitely a winnable spot for them. I, I think that's definitely worth considering. Um, but in, in general, this, uh, this, this Arizona state team, uh, you know, two straight losses and they've come back to earth to, to where probably Arizona state, 
was expected to be, which is maybe about a six and six, seven and five team at the end of the year. Sure, but you know what? They're I'm I'm sort of encouraged by the fact that and yes, they should beat San Diego State, and it was a weird ending to that game. To lose to Washington, even after beating them last year, and to not look particularly good and be in this game, I I'm not a big moral victory person. I don't think, but it's something because this Washington team is much more talented than this Arizona State team and, and should beat them by 10 five. the spread was 17 so at least the perception of this Washington team was pretty far out ahead of Arizona State and ASU just I don't know if it's the coaching again I, I just sort of watched highlights of this game I'll go back and watch it more fully soon it's at least they're feisty at least there's some sort of buy-in and belief with things with a, an unusual situation I would say yeah Arizona State's um, you know the identity that you're going to be very, very aggressive defensively, and you've got a quarterback and a wide receiver who are uh, among the best quarterback wide yes. receiver tandems in the conference. Like that, that's an identity, and I that want, is what Arizona State is. And I can rock with that. I want to pre-apologize for confusing Nikhil Harry with Nikosi Perry. That is going to happen. It is a reality, <laughs> and it it reflects poorly on me and my ability to cleanly remember things so i'm just getting that out ahead now that it appears miami has a new starting quarterback um and finally arizona arizona excuse me with a a nice comfortable win over the course of the game uh cleo tate has a a a nice day he's not running i think he's been a little bit beat up but he throws the ball fine against uh, oregon state and the big thing is jj taylor leads the way he's one of my more just individually fun players to watch because he looks like he's about 5'2 and 85 pounds and just runs past people when he's healthy. How uh, how tall was Kadeem Carey? Wasn't he short? No, I think he was actually, t- I think he was like 6'1". I think he was tall. actually tall. Um, I like I like any Arizona running back that can just explode through the hole and all of a yeah. sudden dash down the field. Yeah, we saw it with Nick Wilson recently as well. Nick Wilson, um, yeah. So, yeah, maybe he was the smaller guy. Um, so that is your, those are the, the power five games that are at least worth mentioning, but this week belongs to old dominion let's be honest odu (laughs) and the monarchs run run everything this week um smu with a nice last second win always like seeing somebody go for two in overtime to just flat out win it so the mustangs get their first win of the season a nice win over navy toledo and a bit of a shootout over nevada um nevada nevada somebody hates something um cincinnati comes back against ohio uh, they fall down 24-7, but they come back and win that game and move to 4-0 very quietly, including that it's a, a win over Ohio and a win over UCLA with where Cincy has been these past couple years. I, I'd say pretty impressive. Um, beyond that, uh, Colorado State. Woof. Colorado State mm. loses to Illinois State, an FCS team. App State, which I have no idea where Boone is as compared to Raleigh and how far away you are. But App State, About three hours. Three hours. Okay. App State very quietly because of, I mean, not super quietly because how they looked against Penn State, but Zach Thomas has looked excellent. They've run the ball super well. They've got two good running backs. I mean, they demolish a Gardner-Webb team that nobody's expecting anything from, but App State is, at least if you're a Sunbelt fan right now, they look they look dangerous. So there's that. They're the class of the Sunbelt. They are, like, they oh, yeah. are the class of the Sunbelt. And that's... Uh, that- Scott Satterfield's a dude. Oh that, is, that is a that is a that is uh, a coach who I uh, I'm 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 betting I'm betting that we're going to see him at a Power Five job at some point in the next five years. I would I think that's fair to say. Houston big over Texas Southern. North Texas big another quiet four and and0 team, and that includes a win over Arkansas, which whatever fine it's still an sec team there's nothing to hold your head about uh memphis in a bit of a shootout another nice game for their offense and setting up a really nice uh game i want to say in three weeks against ucf who wins big eventually over fau utah state uh, a mountain west team that's quietly making a little bit of noise after being very competitive against michigan state san diego state pulls it out against a sneaky tough eastern michigan team and hawaii and cole mcdonald are now four and one and McDonald goes for, I want to say he has five touchdowns in this game. So there's a lot of fun to be had. And just to bring things full circle, you don't need to freak out over a random writer's top four in late September. Watch college football no, like don't it's do a that. TV show. Because then you get Hawaii and Cole McDonald. The Mountain West is having a much-needed resurgent year. I thought yes. the Mountain West was a little bit bad 
<laughs> last season, mm-hmm. maybe even the season before. And again, I, I judge conferences by the middle. And if you can give me a solid core, I mean, a solid core, really the key to everything. Yes. Uh, if you can give me a solid core, then, then I'm, I'm going to believe uh, that that is a conference worth tuning into. And Hawaii, uh, with Cole McDonald bringing the run and shoot back, Utah State, which you mentioned, has you know, finally uh, come back and really starting to look good again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, Mountain West is fun. That is absolutely a league worth investing in this year. And real quick, before we finish and talk about our dudes, I did neglect to do a dramatic reading of a drive chart. And damn it, if Mississippi State didn't make this one difficult, um, but it, I'm, I'm going to go with the Bulldogs here because punt, punt. Hey, touchdown, punt, punt, halftime, punt, 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 interception, downs, punt. Thank, thank you, Mississippi State. Clanga, clanga. Maybe next <laughs> week. Maybe next week. Um, and real quick, if we didn't mention any of these dudes, I would like to point them out real quick. British comedy legend alan bowman at texas tech miles sanders ian book we didn't mention notre dame beating wake decisively and i ty even sent me he watched this game i think on his phone he sent me an ian book manifesto (laughs) which thanks ty i'll put some more dvorak on for that too his ian book manifesto is the headlines will be all about ian book's great performance against wake and rightfully so Clearly, he was able to lead the offense in a way that utilized all the parts, and he should absolutely be the starter from here on out. That said, there are three other things we need to keep in mind. Brian Kelly didn't screw up a quarterback controversy. I don't know why I'm doing this in a bad British accent. Maybe the yoga classes are working. Maybe he learned from the Zaira. Maybe he learned from watching Nick Saban in the national championship. I can't, there's so much here. Two, this really sucks for Brandon Wimbush. He could have transferred anywhere in the country two years ago when the Irish seemingly had two stud quarterbacks. Instead, he stuck with it and eventually got the job. I hope we still see him as part of the offense. Long live the strange Ian Book third and short packages. Can we somehow bury this in a time capsule? I don't ever want to forget the odd situational games that Brian Kelly played before coming to his senses. So, there is Ty from the great not being on the show today um so ian book he's a dude uh justin herbert to dylan mitchell ben burke hervin was all over the place for washington david long for the west virginia defense gerald willis was particularly he was interrupting fiu all the time for miami josh allen at kentucky caden stearns for texas army just in the amount of time they spent on the field kenneth murray for oklahoma making the plays on said field all of old dominion and as we mentioned at the end jj taylor This has been an extremely long show and an extreme pleasure on my end. Thank you very much, Chip. Mackenzie Milton, six touchdowns. Yes. That game, I I believe it's like October 13th, UCF Memphis. It's it's a must watch. Yeah, I mean, I I like it. There is nothing, yeah, especially coming off of last year. And UCF has, well, they have the North Carolina game canceled, but... Pitt, SMU, Memphis, ECU, Temple, Navy, Cincinnati, USF. Maybe outside of that last week, they're going to Tampa to play USF. There's nothing obvious loss-wise on this schedule. There's oh. nothing glaring for the Knights, which <laughs> you're right. You, are, I mean, Mackenzie Milton is probably a top 8, 10 quarterback in the country. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this is – that's a good point. Monitor this situation – Thank you, everybody, for listening to the show. I apologize that it ran long, but it was an exciting, fun week. And you know what? Spending a long time talking about college football or listening to two idiots like ourselves talk about college football, it's not the worst thing in the world. Solidverbal at gmail.com. Follow us at Solidverbal. Pay attention to our pick'em pool. We're releasing new shirts this week. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll see you soon. Peace.